Dear class, welcome back to PLS C3553, Lectures on the French Revolution by Dalberg Acton. So this is part two of the lecture. Um, right now, I just posted the first part and concluded in that that the during the French Revolution, sec, the civil society, in particular the elites, and also the major sort of the majority of the population were experiencing some kind of resistance to the church, right? So people were questioning the church because uh, the church was engaged in all kinds of extreme forms of activities, such as extreme types of punishment. That's mentioned in Dalberg. And this aspect of the church's uh, excesses, uh, not just corruption, but also punishment, the role of punishment is something that we'll look at more when we talk about Michel Foucault's readings, which I will post during this weekend. And so you guys can look at those things. But in this lecture, let's focus on what Dalberg said, okay? So he mentioned that secularism is on the rise, at least within the intelligentsia. And uh, he also mentioned that the religion, the role of religion has is being questioned right now, right? And uh, religion used to galvanize people to fight wars so that kings could take over territory of other kings or monarchs, right? So what do you have when you cannot galvanize people under religion anymore because now they're angry with the churches, right? One of the things immediately that has to happen is you must stop thinking about war because you can't excite people in the same way to have these wars over territories, right? So you have to establish peace. So nationalism or this ability to galvanize people in you know, this identity politics, you cannot have it anymore about religion because society is rejecting the church, right? In, in, in certain ways, it's rejecting the power of the church, maybe not the religion. So it challenges the ability of the state to harness the power of the church for its own territorial expansion. So now we have to think about other ways of harnessing the power of the people. How do you get the people excited to fight these wars? So the big question, what kind of nationalism will arise in such a society? So one way we can do this is look at the logic of the modern state, right? Who are the philosophers who thought about this question? How do you galvanize people? Or what do you do with this population now that you cannot take the population to war? What is the end goal of such a state? You can't engage in territorial expansion the way that you could before. You can't excite people to do that. Does the state have any logic to it then? The physiocrats are a group that start writing in the 1500s and many of them inspire Adam Smith and others in England. So these are a group of writers. Most of them are French and some of them are British, but they start concerning themselves with the economic issues. And they propose that the state should not be concerned just with territorial security or expansion, but should be concerned with issues that affect the population, such as economic issues. One of the main goals of the state is then to facilitate trade and other kinds of economic activity that create a sound economic system. So you can't have scarcity in a system where you're not just reliant on food production, but you allow trade to happen. When there's trade, 
people can resolve shortages, right? So if there's any kind of scarcity, they can fill that gap using food from other parts of the world. So physiocrats are saying, take a systems approach. Look at the economic system. Don't just think about what the monarchy is interested in. Look at the economic system, look at the social system, what kind of issues are there, try to solve them. So suddenly the state is concerned with solving problems. And we'll look more about this when we talk about Michel Foucault because he, in his book, talks about what the state does. Rousseau, who is discussed by Dalberg Acton. He looks a little bit at sort of what's happening within civil society. So we start with Rousseau because the physiocrats are talking about civil society. They're trying to understand what is happening, the economic activity is happening, how are the population affected, what should be the state role, what other kinds of power can the state have? And we'll talk about that later. But Rousseau is shedding some light into civil society. And he says that if you take away the state, you take away the monarchy, the, the government rather, the state of nature is quite good. It, you know, the state of nature is basically the state without government, right? Without the Leviathan, as Thomas Hobbes had said. So there's no government. And he says, because nature is in the image of God, and therefore it's good. So state of nature being good means that without a government, people in civil society can live and, you know, in a in a good way, they can be decent, they can uh, coexist peacefully. And Rousseau argues it is civilization that is crafted by clever men and therefore is bad. So he is anti-civilization. And he says, as the society has moved from a state of nature to civilization, you see the rise of tyranny, right? You see from all these kings, their goal is to serve themselves and therefore they have created unjust laws, right? So Rousseau presumes that people are essentially good and right. So this brings us back to the question of justice and injustice. So people perceive their situation is being made worse by the tyranny of kings, right? And so the question of injustice and punishments. So he goes into these philosophers, as we talked about earlier, looking at the types of injustices. And in the rest of the book, talks more about these things. Right now, we can ask the question, okay, so all these physiocrats existed, but they influenced both England and France. Rousseau uh, and other philosophers existed both in England and France. And if you look at English, history, you can find evidence of um, scholars who were talking about, you know, questioning the divine right of kings and things like that. Why then has monarchy survived in England and not in France? So Dalberg and Acton provide a little bit of evidence about those things. So Acton says that in England, the 1688 constitutional revolution essentially saved the monarchy. Yes, the monarch had to give up some of his powers, but he realized that if he did not give those powers up, he couldn't keep his throne. And so it was a timely move that saved the monarchy. But in France, no such corrections were made. The opposite thing happened. The 
absolute power of monarchs was established, right? Instead of sharing power with the aristocracy and with others in society, the, the absolute uh, absolutism essentially led to an irreversible situation in France where the people were so, uh, you know, destroyed by the economic, uh, rather the inequalities and the injustice that they have to overthrow the, uh, the monarch. So were there movements or rather people that actually supported the royalists or, or rather the royal, uh, the monarchy essentially. And we see that yes, there were many that argued that monarchy should be preserved or even aristocracy should be preserved, right? So within the French system, you have Baron de Montesquieu, he wrote the spirit of the laws, right? And he sort of discussed here as uh, proposing that aristocratic rule is better than democratic rule. So within the French, you had some philosophers who resisted complete democracy. And Montesquieu is saying, look, the program or rather the, the a uh, whole plan to save the monarchy actually worked well for England. So we should really do it in France, right? So he's for a transition, but not straight to democracy. However, we don't see that kind of clear cut action actually taking place in France. Were there periods when the Catholics and the Protestants actually worked together in France? So here we see that um, there were particular treaties, right? Or these kinds of laws passed, which granted um, the Calvinist Protestant certain rights within France. They gained civil rights, they could have many liberties, including what professions they chose, where they worked, etc. And many served within the government. So you see that the role of religion as a dividing force uh, between nations is actually being reduced, right? Within the French state, you see a rise in secular kind of laws because they are looking not at the person's religion, but at their capabilities. So you have the 16th century war of religion among Catholics and Protestants, but many of the Protestants eventually end up serving the monarch. Okay, so we talked about how some Protestants did not serve the monarch like Juro and Melchard because the monarchy was considered as uh, despotic, right? You can also compare to England, you see that James II, the King of England in 1680s, he allows Catholics to play a role in government. So because he's not very popular, himself being a Catholic, he's not favored by the majority of princes in England. So he tries to increase the Catholic power within England, right? And therefore, as the minority in the Protestant Anglican country, he actually allows this um, power sharing to happen when he creates the, uh, the reforms in 1688, where the aristocracy or rather the Protestant and Anglicans and others 
are invited to play a role in the government. So at that point, you have the Bill of Rights. So he's giving up certain amounts of power because he's the minority in this situation, but he's allowing the Protestants to have, a, you know, sort of uh, not equal amount of power, but proportional power perhaps, right? So you have to maintain balance of power within your state so that there's no civil war again. So here are the changes that we talked about. So lastly, the uh, coming back to the question of why the French Revolution happened, in chapter two, um, Dalberg Acton kind of talks about What's really going on that's exciting the regular people of France? And he thinks it has to do with the American Revolution of 1776. Here again, I would say that the influence probably has, you know, impacts the middle class because who really knows about what's happening in another country if they are busy toiling in the fields, right? So I'm not sure that it was able to mobilize the majority of the population, but I do think it had an economic impact on the population because they were raising the money to facilitate the uh, war in America, right? So it did impact them, and I'm not clear and is definitely not clear for from Dalbert Acton to what extent regular people knew about this. But it's very possible that the intelligentsia, the monarchy, the aristocrats, and the middle class had some idea of what was happening. Especially if they were engaged in trade, they would know what's happening. So Again, Dalbert Acton sort of philosophizes about what the American Revolution was about. So they overthrew the monarchy and they wanted liberty for the people, right? And he says, it's a model that had succeeded. Hence, it was a powerful example to the people in France who wanted to change things. But he's also talking a hundred years later, but also removed from the American colonies. And he is trying to sort of grasp about what happened during the American Revolution. Um, and of course, you know that history is something that keeps being rewritten based on our uh, you know, sort of scientific studies, going back and looking at records and trying to understand what really existed. So he says that American colonies were more democratic. They did not have older institutions like feudalism. However, this is wrong. We know that indentured servants were the main workers in the northern part of the U.S. And slavery was the main source of labor in the southern parts. So these are essentially feudal systems because you have the same kind of power inequalities. You have one group of people working in the fields and another group of people enjoying the profits of this labor, right? So we have a feudal system. So he is wrong in saying that the institutions were all gone. Causes of the uh, American Revolution. So he says England tried to limit types of occupations. It increased taxes in the colonies and there was taxation without representation. He of course does not mention the monopoly power that is given to the British East India Company by the British Crown, which causes an uproar in the, the trading, the merchant communities in the US or rather in the colonies, because these people now have to pay a large amount of uh, fines or fees to the British East India Company. No trade can happen 
without the British, British East India Company, right? So now you're basically at the mercy of the British East India Company, rather. So you can't make money if you're an American uh, merchant, or rather a merchant in the colonies, right? So these are the causes of the American Revolution. Then the US Constitution. He again thinks this is a source of inspiration for the French revolutionaries. And this may beg the question, you know, if the French revolutionaries were inspired by this document, why did the French monarchy help the Americans? This is a legitimate question. Why would you empower the group of people that will inspire destabilization within the within your own country. So I think that the monarchy was considered with accruing new land, finding new land in the US, and you see that um, they go after the Spanish because the Spanish have acquired a large amount of land in the US, and then Napoleon basically uh, takes over Spain in the 18, early 1800s, and then an entire one third of the US territory actually becomes uh, Louisiana, right? The territory of the French. And that territory is what Napoleon then has to sell when he loses or uh, he's losing wars in Europe and needs to basically finance his wars again. So he sells it back to the US, right? So this is a good question. It's like, if this document was inspiring the French revolutionaries, why did the French monarchy help them, right? So the question arises, it, is it for strategic reasons? It seems short-sighted for sure. Um, they did want more money out of it. They probably thought at least they would have new territories, if not, uh, you know, money. Because if you are actually giving money to the U.S. government or other the co colonial, the colonies there, and saying you're going to pay us back with interest, then of course you can say, okay, it was for economic reasons or financial gains, right? So then, of course, Dalbert Acton is talking about the founding fathers. He's saying, look, some of them love the British Constitution. So the American Constitution has to have many aspects of the British Constitution, many of the institutions of the British system were admirable. So he talks about John Adams, he talks about James Otis, some uh, the Bostonian. Um, again, these people are all talking about making the laws of the nation just based on reason and of course, uh, based on some kind of canonical understanding, right? And then he points to the British House of Commons as truly representing the people of the nation. However, uh, he says that the, even though the Americans, they love the British constitution and their legal rules, uh, they are totally against object, you know, they're objecting to taxation without representation. So here is pretty much what we have so far. And in the last chapter, uh, it was sort of the dark <laughs> kind of conclusion in the sense that they're talking about all the things that happen after the revolution, uh, all the people that die due to the revolution, how is civil society coping with, you know, the demise of so many people, uh, how are they restoring law and order? And he's kind of wraps it up there. 
So let's stop here. This lecture is very, very choppy because so many things are being accomplished within the first two chapters. He sort of jumps around a bit, but uh, comes back to what he thinks is the are the more important causes of the revolution. So let's wrap it up here and hopefully you can watch these two parts of the lecture. Um, on Monday, hopefully we will have a proper class, in-person class, and then we can talk more about Foucault.